I've had the interesting experience in high school, you know, you're always looking for a fantastic theology program. How can we teach the faith to our students? And, and the obvious solution is, well, why don't we read the catechism of the church? You know, and so 25 years ago, well, 35 years ago, before the new catechism came out, I had convinced my school, I said, well, let's use the, let's use the catechism of the Council of Trent. And then I think within a, a couple of years of my suggestion, the new catechism came out. And so we use that instead. But it is interesting, you know, various teachers have told me that have tried to use the new catechism in a high school classroom. It is a tough text from which to teach high school students. You have to be really, you know, high school students tend to be the kinds of students that, you know, they, what makes a class go is that the teacher has some points he's going to make and then he's going to give some reasons for those points and you can, you can write them on the chalkboard and the students can, they see the point and then they can see two or three reasons for the point and they, everyone feels great. Throughout life, we meet others who have insights and experiences quite unlike our own. The great ideas of classical works resonate differently with them. Often these treasures of mind and heart go unshared, reserved from others in the course of daily life. But what if we took the time to have those conversations, to sit down and recall those thoughts, those impressions upon us that moved us along our path? Why then, we would no longer be alone, and at least for one shimmering moment, someone else could see the world through our eyes. I give you the Confederal Reserve. Welcome to the Confederal Reserve presented by Better Pairs. I am your host, Dr. Jason Fujikawa. The Confederal Reserve is a show that connects old friends, that is, Confederates, to discuss the ideas and classical works that have shaped their lives and worldviews. Before we get going, I invite you to like this episode, subscribe to the Better Pairs channel if you have not already, and click the bell icon to receive notifications so that you remain the first to know of future interviews and podcast episodes. If you would like to support the work of Better Pairs with your Federal Reserve notes and receive fractional gold in the mail each month, please follow the link in the description to our crowdfunding program, Better Pairs Leaves. As a special bonus for the rest of 2024, every qualifying contribution earns an entry in our monthly Market Mug giveaway. Official rules are available at betterpairs.com slash giveaway. Now then, the structure of our show is our gimmick we want you to mimic. Our guest for the episode will offer a classical work of particular import to his or her life. What ensues is a conversation that uncovers insights and offers new perspectives on old works. It is a conversation between friends, which is the building block of the cultural renaissance that Better Pairs seeks to foster. Our guest today is Mark Langley. Mark Langley studied the liberal arts at Thomas Aquinas College and has been a classical Catholic educator for 35 years. He currently hosts the Catechism of the Council of Trent in Less Than a Year podcast. His writing can be found at lionandox.com. It's my great pleasure to welcome our guest today on the Confederal Reserve, Mark Langley. Welcome, Mark. Thanks so much, Jason, for having me. What an honor to be on Better Paris. It's tremendous, uh, tremendous honor. Well, we are, very, we are very glad to have you, Mark. Uh, we will kick it off, uh, as I said, right with our, with our, uh, our question we ask every guest. What is your vintage work and why is it so important? Well, okay. Um, so, yeah, my vintage work uh, is the Catechism of the Council of Trent. And uh, I, this is a book that I think should be on every, everybody's bookshelf. I, I did note that it's not on your bookshelf behind you. I think we should get a, send you a copy. <laughs> I've got this be beautiful copy, Baronius Press, which I recommend. Um, just make sure it's not upside down there. But uh, so the Catechism of the Council of Trent is is a work that I've been studying for the last uh, the last couple couple years, and it's a, I recommend it to, uh, to everyone. So so maybe uh, just just to clarify, because some people might be um, aware of like the what we call the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and so and so how does how does like the 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 big green giant right or the big blue giant now. Uh, the, the catechism that came out under uh, Pope John Paul II, how does that, how is that understood relative to the catechism of the Council of Trent? Right, thanks for asking that. Um, the, in one of the early episodes of my uh, podcast on the catechism of the Council of Trent, I go through the history of the production of this catechism, and that question you're asking right there, it really is the pivotal question people say well doesn't uh doesn't the new catechism the catechism of the catholic church doesn't that sort of replace prior texts 
and uh, shouldn't we sort of move on? And I think that's a mistake to think that. The Catechism of the Council of Trent, I see as sort of the primary text where the church sets forth its teaching on the the sacraments, the commandments, and the creed, and prayer. And then, I, the way I view the new catechism, I think Pope John Paul II saw a need to address modern issues that, that, that of course, were not around necessarily in the 16th century. Um, of course, I guess every nothing's new under the sun, but mm-hmm. I, think, I think John Paul II saw a need to have a new kind of address to the faithful, and but he certainly didn't. And I think I, I haven't seen I haven't seen this quote for a while, but I think I remember um, him saying that, or or someone saying that the new catechism was not meant to replace the catechism of the Council of Trent, but rather to sort of supplement it. And and so I I hold it's my position that really every Catholic should have. Both of these catechisms, of course, but perhaps the right order of procedure would be to read the Catechism of the Council of Trent. You know, it was produced in 1566 under St. Charles Borromeo and St. Pius V. After the, the, the Council of Trent, of course, I think there were 25 sessions, and I'm not a church historian, so I, I, <laughs> I have trouble with the details. Yes, very but, very long council, right? It's like seven, seventeen years, I think, right? Uh, and, and so, sure. and so, a, a, a goodly bit opposed to we think of Vatican II as, as a long council, but but that's only four sessions. So, uh, a, a lot to be discussed, a lot of um, time and energy that went into the Council of Trent, uh, kind of right there, smack dab in the, the middle of the 16th century, and and so um, maybe maybe one one way that that we can kind of wrap our heads around it is that the Council of Trent is more kind of squarely maybe a, a, a dogmatic council, right? And and was dealing with uh, dogmatic. That sounds like an interesting kind of word, right? But but kind of doctrinal issues concerning kind of the rise of Protestantism and what is it that the Church believes and kind of enunciating that in a kind of clear way. Whereas Vatican II, at least in its sort of programming or how it is, you know, uh, in, in its own documentation, but also in how it is presented to us, right, as a sort of pastoral council, and and in in a way, um, I think in retrospect we see it as sort of preempting sort of the crisis of of society and culture of the end of the 20th century uh, that we are kind of <laughs> that we reverberate now in our own day here in the 21st, uh, but. But the Council, or Second Vatican Council, didn't have something like the Reformation that it is responding to directly, but it, in a sense, sort of uh, preemptively addresses these concerns of, of what we call the modern world, and and therefore is um, kind of seeking a, a kind of pastoral teaching to, yeah, I, I, I don't know how to, how you would say it, like say old things in new ways uh, uh, to yeah. present. Kind of the truths of the of the the Catholic faith in uh, not only the language but perhaps even the mode of of the modern world. Um, maybe maybe that's one way you could kind of talk about the the Catechism of the Council of Trent. What is kind of its structure? Because maybe we're familiar with the the Second Universal Catechism of the Church, or we call it the Catechism, just generally. Uh, is 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 the Catechism of the Council of Trent written differently? Well. Uh, you know, and before before I answer that, I I just want to applaud your entire description there. I thought that was excellent <laughs> um, with re- with respect to the the difference between the two counties and and the 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 uh, the different environment and the as you were saying the, to address Catholics in the sort of the modern mode. I really do think is a mark of the new catechism, um, and and also I would add to that. You know, it's interesting if you look at the if you look at the index in the new catechism. Um, and you compare the citations of St. Thomas Aquinas to the citations of St. Augustine, it's remarkable, and uh, maybe somebody can check me out on this, but the last time I looked, the citations of St. Augustine were perhaps twice as many as St. Thomas. And now that that should be fact-checked, but I, I do believe there was a studied attempt to speak to the faithful 
in sort of a more Augustinian fashion, and, and of course many other fathers. I mean, the New Catechism is replete with uh, citations of all sorts of people besides St. Thomas Aquinas, whereas the Catechism of the Council of Trent is really the primary source is obviously there St. Thomas Aquinas. Every page, um, and this goes to your question, mm -hmm. it's written almost as, you know, if somebody wanted to get a short uh, an abbreviated view of the Summa Theologica, uh, that mammoth work. The Catechism of the Council of Trent follows the Summa so closely that uh, sometimes I think it's a little, um, I think there should be perhaps a little bit more attribution in the text itself because it's, it follows St. Thomas Aquinas so closely. But uh, to your question uh, it, about how it's structured, uh, should we proceed to that right now? Or, or Sure, um, sure. Yeah, I have something about Augustine I want to bring up in a second. But, but yeah, if you could kind of uh, illuminate for our listeners sort of how it, are there are there kind of clear demarcations in the structure of the Council, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, because because I think we might be more familiar in terms of like older catechisms, say like a, a Baltimore catechism, which is more the sort of question and answer format that that our listeners might be more familiar with also Baltimore Catechism is sort of an English document granted yes. Catechism of the Council of Trent I'm assuming right uh, officially in Latin even though it might have been to kind of devised in in other European languages uh, yes. initially well the, the the and that's interesting because uh, you know St. Charles Borromeo was the one I think that insisted that you know he gathered together the greatest Latinist of the of the era back then in the 16th century and um, he demanded that the Catechism of the Council of Trent uh, be written in the most elegant and eloquent rhetorical style and he gathered them together to make the entire you know the Catechism of the Council of Trent was put together over many years as a fruit a fruit of that Council of Trent but they worked on it to make sure that the whole thing was consistent and uh, unified and written in sort of the same style, even though many authors had contributed to it. Um, but the, the, you know, it should be pointed out that, an, you know, another big difference between the two catechisms is that the Catechism of the Council of Trent was written, the primary audience was parish priests, pastors. Hmm. I think the Latin title is Catechismus ad Parochos. The catechism for the the priests or parish priests. So, whereas the new catechism, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, I believe that the primary audience audience for the new catechism, you know, really was bishops. Although, although I think it says, you know, it's it's, it's for all the faithful. But I think the catechism of the Council of Trent was written uh, with sort of a more practical goal in mind to meet the to meet the needs of the faithful in the pews from their pastors so so that the catechism of the council of trent really was designed to help pastors instruct the faithful in the pews uh, uh, you know famously there's a there's a large sermon program that um, you can find in these texts where pastors can go to the sermon program and, and preach on various parts of the catechism every sunday of the year um, so that's an interesting thing. I, sure. So that's, I think that's no, kind of a, I, also a different. That is kind of interesting because how, how it tracks in the sense of when we look at, say, the Council of Trent and, and think about uh, kind of the various sort of focal points of the council. Um, yes, there's sort of the kind of direct doctrinal um, clarification on things like justification, on the sacraments, on the canon of scripture. And yet, mm -hmm. and yet, some of the more kind of uh, odd intra um, to the to the church itself, practical norms that came about would be right the, the education and formation of priests, right, and and sort of a codification of their various roles and and the the orders, the minor orders, like like uh, how do we how do we get the life of the parish to um, have sort of a quality control, right? Uh, and, and consistency and and uh, kind of a formal structure that that is sort of the bread and butter of of the Roman rite at least right it's just sort of cookie yeah. cutter you know we will take we'll take the the Roman rite we will stamp it across the world kind of thing that 
that it would make sense that the catechism flowing from those teachings of the council would have as their audience like the parish priest and yet still be of, of a sort not to be like uh, you know, the lady themselves. One, because of questions of um, literacy, right? Uh, and whether yes. the lady would even kind of understand it. Uh, and and also just, yeah, concerns about um, kind of the the overproduction or the, the use of this printing press thing, which seems to maybe fuel some of the problems that preceded the reason for the council and the Reformation. Uh, yes, so right. so it, it is a step down or a step lower in the hierarchy from simply the the, uh, the, the, the bishops, and yet um, kind of focused on what we in kind of modern ministry call like the parish experience, right? Um, whereas, whereas with the council, uh, Second Vatican Council, uh, we start to see, you know, constitutions uh, from that council addressed to, you know, not only the hierarchy and, 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 and the faithful, but like people of goodwill, right? Just sort of open-ended documents <laughs> Uh, that that are new. That that is sort of that is uh, not not been kind of in the traditional tradition of sort of encyclicals or papables that that come out between Trent and Vatican I. You know, it, it is sort of in Vatican II where we see uh, the Church directly speaking to people who want to listen and not just uh, to herself, to to the faithful, to those within the hierarchy, um, the people of God, broadly understood as as those sort of sacramentally within the flock of the church and even those who are not the, the Catholic yes. curious of the world. And so, and so it, it makes sense that then the catechism flowing from second Vatican council under the, under the, uh, in the pontificate of, of John Paul II would um, also have this sort of trajectory in its presentation to everyone that, that is accessible in that sense. Whereas, say maybe yes. the question, maybe the, the question and answer format of say the Baltimore, cat Baltimore Catechism, it's less episodic. You you, you kind of have to go through it, and like that's its style, and that's what it was purposed for. But whereas whereas now we can use like the uh, you know the Second Universal Catechism, I, I'm going to come up with a term for it, right? Uh, uh, as yeah. as sort of that book I keep on my shelf, so I can pull out and go to the index, and then and then find the passage that tells my relatives how they shouldn't live how they're living, right? Um, no. <laughs> whereas, <laughs> uh, whereas the catechism is, is in generally is, is more, right, a whole. And it has a beginning, yeah. and it has a middle, and it has an end. And that things build, like, doctrinal and, and pastoral concerns um, and, and sort of the, the habit of the Christian life builds from the beginning to the end in a cohesive whole, right? There's an intelligibility yes. to a catechism, whereas... Uh, the current form of it in, in, in the second, the second modern, the second universal catechism has the ability to be kind of treated episodically, treated like a, like a, go to the index, find this thing, and I can just look at this one thing. All right. You, you know, um, it's interesting, um, you, you know, whereas I think a lot of people think of that, uh, you mentioned the Baltimore catechism in that question and answer form. And, and I, you know, I don't know the history of the Baltimore catechism, um, I believe that I believe that the Baltimore Catechism, and you know, all, all these there's lots of lots of catechisms, uh, but I think the Catechism of the Council of Trent was really the rock bed upon which these other catechisms that you can find in different countries, and they're all they all go back to this Catechism of the Council of Trent as as presenting, as you were saying, sort of a, a Roman uniformity throughout the world on the teachings of the Church. Uh, I, I would. I would remark that, you know, it's interesting, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, the basic order of the whole thing, which I think some people find remarkable, it's, it's, it's actually sort of obvious, it, it's divided into four parts. Now, I think the new Catechism is also divided into four parts, is that, is that right? I, Correct, it, yes. But, and, and so you might think that there, the division is the same, but the Catechism of the Council of Trent, you know, it starts with the creed, and then it goes on to the sacraments, and then it goes on to the commandments, and the last section is prayer, it, primarily the Lord's Prayer. And so you think, okay, these are sort of a four, it's a division of four. But as I point out in my podcast on it, really it's following the division of the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. So you have the, the creed addressing faith, and then the sacraments as the aids that we have to gain salvation that would foster hope 
And then the commandments, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then prayer, you know, when we unite ourselves with God, those, those last two sections foster charity. So really the Catechism of the Council of Trent has this, I think, this sort of unbeatable division according to the cardinal virtue, I mean the uh, theological virtues, faith, open charity. Whereas, whereas when you take a look at the new catechism, and you, 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 you know, I think you're far more an expert with the new catechism than I am, but um, I've, uh, one of my old professors introduced this question. He said, you know, I, he says, I don't understand the division of the new catechism. It's, it has these various uh, titles like, you know, life in Christ or, um, and, you know, it's, it, even, though, even though it does talk about the creed and the sacraments, and pre, it's, it's divided differently as, as if it's, it's not necessarily following that same order. I, I don't know if that sounds yeah. right to you. But. No, and, and, and my own kind of um, first, you know, encounter with, with the, the Second Universal Catechism did seem like, I, in my mind, I had, like, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger and Cardinal Schoenbrunn, like, like throwing darts at a board somewhere in the Vatican, and it just the the board, the dartboard had like various doctrinal topics, and it was just where did these come from? Uh, <laughs> but but the if the idea, I, I think uh, Dr. Sean Innerst, um in his his work with the the Ladder of Ascent uh, and kind of giving an intelligibility to the structure of the Catechism, I think he's 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 got something there uh, that's really um, kind of helpful to explaining the catechism to people right so that the creed would be sort of the the story of salvation in miniature that that it that it just as the creed kind of moves from uh kind of right the the, the three ages the age of the father the son and the holy spirit uh it tells the history of salvation and 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 yet that's the history of salvation in a very sort of uh, Billy Joel way, right? Um, the fire that started before you, uh, and 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 your kind of role in it is when you are introduced into this great drama uh, through the sacraments, obviously through uh, your initiation, sacraments of initiation, right? Uh, and so and so the sacramental life becomes then my entry into the history of salvation that was recounted in the creed, and then once I'm in into this life in Christ, then how ought I to act? How how do I perform in the drama? And that's the the moral life. Uh, but then but then that the the section on Christian prayer is is that sort of right anagogical step uh, because because our life on earth, our Christian life here, is a pilgrimage, and then where does it end? Where what what is you know, I, as I used to tell my student, like what my students, what what is your five thousand year plan? Where do you see yourself in five thousand years, right? Uh, and that life of prayer and, and uniting one's intellect and will to to God, right? To 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 know perfectly what God has revealed to us, to love perfectly, more perfectly, and increasingly perfectly, uh, God through the goodness, the truth, and the beauty that He's shown us. Right? That that is what life in heaven is, but it's also something that we participate in, that we grow towards. Uh, even in this life. And so that's kind of, I think, um, the best sort of analysis of why in the world they pick these four pillars, these four kind of parts of the of the, the Second Universal Catechism. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I And, you know, even in our respective uh, explanations of the order, you can really, you can really see a different style. Um, and I... You know, as a high school teacher, I tend to be more. Um, I tend to I tend to have a, a propensity for the sort of that clear scholastic division that the Catechism of the Council of Trent has. You know, faith, hope, and charity. <laughs> <laughs> whereas, whereas the explanation you gave, I think, does demand. It's it's sort of a very meditative. It's a lot more difficult to explain that to a secondary school. <laughs> Well, but 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 I think I think there is there is sort of a, a I don't know if genius is the right word to it, um, but but imagine a world classically in in, in rhetoric right in, in insofar as a, a catechism is uh, a, a, an instrument of of rhetoric of trying to convince somebody of trying to move somebody toward holding right a, an, an opinion or in a belief or a thought that that if if you if you Take away, you know, the classical kind of three, right? Is logos, um, 
ethos and 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 uh, and pathos, right? Uh, so oh, logic sure. and 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 ethos is sort of like who's saying it, uh, what is being said, logic, who's saying it, and then how and pathos, what what kind of emotions are being elicited from it. Um, uh, a world in which, say, Logos has, has fallen aside. Maybe you can imagine such a world. Maybe you live in such a world in which mm. uh, reason and logic and and kind of the clarity of well-defined terms uh, are kind of the bedrock of of how intellectual or just common discourse occur. Uh, ethos, where there are structures of authority and that that authority is respected, not just sort of blindly, but but because it is sort of tied to the the good functioning of society, um, mm-hmm. you know, what starts in mere survival can also <laughs> perpetuate afterwards, right? We listen to authoritative voices because they, you know, I, I, I you imagine, um, or one of my experiences in Oklahoma is is that that communities like to keep up their traditions, right? They they don't do things a certain way. Um, kind of the farther you get out, maybe the bigger cities in Oklahoma. You know, uh, and 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 the the city slicker like myself might say, oh, that's very you know, stubborn of you. Uh, but what you find is like no, like farming in such a way and and holding things and and doing things in certain manners are what keep people alive. You know, all the other people went back east after the land rush, right? Uh, mm. That that the traditions kind of exist because that's how the society exists. Sometimes you have traditions that become obsolete or don't conform to the the needs of the society in the present and then there's sort of modifications in the development of those traditions but um, on the whole right the traditions are traditions because they are kind of um, things that happened over and over again and worked the the Mm -hmm. things that happened and didn't work out we stopped doing those anyway so so you lose lose logos you lose ethos you're left with pathos right you're left with kind of right a passion, an impassioned response. Uh, uh, it's sort of not logical, but but how, how does this make me feel, right? Mm. My, my, the vibes, the feels, right? The, the all the kind of lingo of of our younger generations are are kind of sentiments that that older generations now still cling to, are still kind of moved by, and and I think there's sort of a a, a very kind of uh, clear um, trajectory in sort of our, our current pontificate and the last the two prior from John Paul II through Benedict to, to Pope Francis where uh, there's a recognition of a lack of logos right uh, John Paul II is kind of trying to hold on to that right uh, that but but there's this something in like uh, Deus es caritas or God is love right of of Benedict XVI yeah. in which in which he's pointing to um kind of beauty and 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 the desirability of God in order to reach uh, a world that has lost the ability to reason and and so yeah. and so I, I see again in the way that the Second Vatican Council kind of preempts the problems of the, the latter half of the 20th century um, that that our, our popes of late have been concerned with uh, the inability of of reason to to rule the day in their in their correspondence it it is frustrating to those of us who like rational uh, <laughs> <laughs> clarity and reason and all these other kinds of things it, it is it is extremely frustrating yeah uh, that's interesting yeah because because but but it needs to you know what remains then still needs to be grounded in that truth even though the appeal to be more on the, on the side of pathos, on, on the passions, on um, the the way that beauty still captivates, and the most beautiful yeah. thing is 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 God, right? Uh, yeah. you know, God is a thing, is a weird, right? the beautiful being, right? And, and and how all beauty kind of stems from God. Uh, it, there can be beautiful things that can draw us away from God, right? But but that's more, I guess, a question of. Of, of magnitude and reflection than uh, kind of what is essentially the case of, that God in every everywhere and in every way is still trying to draw us to himself. Yeah. So there was a lot. Well, that's of things, interesting. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. 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 And, and, you know. And and I'm I maybe I maybe um, misunderstanding a um, part of your point there, but 
you know, the, the when you when you we're still talking about the two catechisms, and when, sure. when you put them side by side, I think you're really uh, right when you I think you're suggesting that the catechism of the Council of Trent lived in a day of logos, and um, the the clear appeal to reason. Every passage, it makes a point, and then it gives reasons for it. Uh, Whereas I don't find that same kind of procedure in the New Catechism. I think you're, if you're suggesting this, that the New Catechism is a, while it is trying to get back to this missing logos, it, nonetheless it, it seems to appeal maybe more to the, uh, the pathos and um, the, the, of these long citations from various fathers that, uh, especially St. Augustine, I think, but um, which seem to move want to move the reader in a more reflective way than than in a class you know I, I should point out that I've had the interesting experience in high school you know you're always looking for a fantastic theology program how can we teach the faith to our students and and the obvious solution is well why don't we read the catechism of the church you know and so 25 years ago well 35 years ago before the new catechism came out I had convinced my school. I said, "Well, let's use the let's use the Catechism of the Council of Trent." And then I think within a, a couple of years of my suggestion, the new Catechism came out, and so we use that instead. But it is interesting, you know. Various teachers have told me that have tried to use the new Catechism in a high school classroom. It is a tough text from which to teach high school students. You have to be really, you know, high school students tend to be. The kinds of students that you know they what makes a class go is that the teacher has some points he's going to make and then he's going to give some reasons for those points and you can you can write them on the chalkboard and the students can they see the point and then they can see two or three reasons for the point and they everyone feels great whereas whereas with the new catechism it's it's much tougher to to get them to all want to read these sort of lengthy i, I would say the new catechism is far more prolix <laughs> I, I think it's just a longer. I, how many pages is it? Is it uh, you know a thousand pages? Or yeah, it depends on your edition. It, it is significant. Yes. <laughs> but so 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 my my point is that as a practical guide for instructing students in the faith, um, I think the the, the Catechism of the Council of Trent is a, a much more advantageous resource for teachers. Again, I'm not. We're, there's, there's, yeah. I, I think we're just highlighting the different purposes of these catechisms. Um, well, uh, I think I think um, the, the the you brought up Augustine again, and I did want to get back to that Augustine point. So thanks uh, to our listeners who stuck around because we're going to talk about Augustine a little bit. Uh, <laughs> that that the idea and having taught from from the Second Universal Catechism. It always feels like you're you're kind of coming into a conversation like halfway through it, uh, or a, a good way through it, right? There are citations, mm -hmm. there are it, it is kind of bringing kind of the whole of the tr tr tradition with you, but um, oftentimes you don't have necessarily um, kind of the the flexibility to 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 read the whole of the catechism. Maybe you are in, in the course of an entire year in in a classroom, but but there there seems to be so many. Um, terms and points used in in the catechism that uh, uh, you 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 end up leaning on ethos more than you really should, right? Oh well, you know I will now quickly define this term and and um, on my authority or on you know this supplementary text that they've also sold us as authority. Uh, th these are what these terms mean, and therefore, logically, this is what the conclusion of the, this paragraph means. Whereas mm -hmm. in primary texts, uh, in um, what I suppose to be you know, more of the Catechism of the Council of Trent, y you would see kind of the logic organically flowing from the, a, a primary text such as the Bible, and then um, kind of played out through the, the reasoning of the fathers and kind of drawn more conclusively. Whereas I find that sort of the modern catechism sort of um, picks away at that, but not in, a, in such a systematic way that, mm. that as an instructor, I, I know that you know, my students can get to a conclusion that is desirable for their own flourishing and 
can, can, and hopefully a conclusion that is both desirable for their own flourishing and can, and corresponds with the, the the teachings of the church. But I don't know if they could get there on their own, right? I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I'm their GPS, and they are beholden to me, the GPS, to get them to that conclusion. But then when they go out into the world, do they? Do they? Can they? Can they do their own orienteering? <laughs> can they? Can they? Can they re-navigate when? When everything the rug gets pulled out from them when they go to college or they go out into the into the into the workforce or, or you know polite society or whatever, uh, and 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 they're struck with ideologies and other kinds of isms that that um, kind of uh, pull them away from from the foundation they've had, which is what which brings me back to Augustine, right? So. So one one thought I have on on kind of the preponderance or the the increased use of Augustine say between the two catechisms um, might have to do with how um, the count, the catechism of the Council of Trent was still in this sort of revitalization of of Aristotle in the time of Saint Thomas right uh, and mm -hmm. and and that sort of uh, understanding of of realism and distinct from, say, the, the Platonism or Neoplatonism that, that dominated in Augustine's day, and, and which you can kind of even see in his, his theological kind of distinctions. Um, and, and I think, perhaps, you know, you can see in, 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 in modern philosophy, in something like a Cartesian dualism, right, uh, a, a, a remix or a, a, uh, a reintroduction of uh, kind of this, this this dualism that that was sort of adjacent to Platonism, uh, right? Because because all sort of heresies are sort of just remixes of older heresies and that kind of thing. Uh, and so and so Augustine's um, take on truth, good, and beauty, uh, truth, goodness, and beauty. In, in a world that was um, highly, um, um, I want to say dismissive of of realism, but but mm -hmm. but there's there's a way that like in through the lens of Augustine and, I, and I've had recently had an interview of on, on talking about Augustine's Confessions, right? That that he is caught up in a in a world of rhetoric, in a world of ideas and thoughts and 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 philosophical arguments that that cause for a confusion of terms like when you read the confessions you say my goodness like that you get hung up on this idea that god has to be a material being for like a very long time uh and and some yeah. of that is just a recognition of of me standing on the shoulders of giants who have you know disabused me of the idea that god is a material being uh, <laughs> and and yet yeah. right those kind of pivotal distinctions are, are things that he has to fight for. And, and, and so I wonder if, you know, in sort of the application of either of the catechisms in our current moment, that there are basic things, basic um, definitions and terms. Uh, the question, you know, the, the big one out, you know, what is a woman, right? Uh, things that previous generations would, would laugh, that you are currently laughing, that we are all kind of laugh in our back of our minds. How do we not know right. these things, right? And yet, yeah. those are things being fought for in the public square. Uh, and so Augustine seems to be this sort of, uh, you know, the saint is the antidote for his age, that, that Augustine really is this antidote for our modern kind of theater of, of in, in that patristic vent of asserting that the word of God is true, right? Asserting that, that truth can be known, <laughs> is intelligible to us, and can be known by reason, and can be known by revelation, right? Uh, these more fundamental things make him more applicable, and and we have fallen back, perhaps, right, a step or two, from from a world that can tolerate the scholastics, and it, it, not tolerate in the sense of put up with, but tolerate in the sense of lift up, uh, kind of the wisdom of the scholastics and and their project of showing the intelligibility of what is true. Uh, we are wrestling tooth and nail, or fighting tooth and nail, <laughs> to 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 cling to what is true. I don't, your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, I, I, and that's very interesting. I, I think that you're, um, you're, you have a very generous um, explanation there of the, 
I, I tend to think of the, of the new catechism. Of course, we, we don't want to be critical of anything the church puts out. Um, I, but I can't help but to lament the the uh, sort of what I think is sort of the lack of clarity on on um, on. Well, you know, there's a lot of things. So, for example, like even take this section. If you compare the two catechisms with respect to their treatment of the sacraments, you know, the catechism of the Council of Trent sticks to the the language of St. Thomas with the whole idea that every sacrament has a matter and a form. And of course, that whole discussion of matter and form is, is, is borrowed from Aristotle's understanding of nature. And so the church, you know, Aquinas, you know, we always say he baptized Aristotle, and we can see that Aristotle had such a significant contribution to the understanding of the faith through the lens of St. Thomas, which... Um, you know, St. Augustine apparently did not quite have the clarity, or maybe didn't have the text. You know more about this than I do. About, I think he ran across the categories, as he mentions in the uh, Confessions, <laughs> and he doesn't seem to be too um, too impressed by by the works of Aristotle. Or, I, I don't think he had. Yeah, no, I always laugh at the categories because that's that's one place where I contend that 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 Augustine might be lying. Where I read the categories and it made complete sense the first time I read it, and you're like. No, that no, no, in no way did that ever happen. Uh, but 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 largely, like the the texts of Aristotle that sort of survive um, the sort of patristic period are the boring ones, um, sort of the ones that are designed for training a lawyer. Uh, so you know, anterior posterior analytics and um, the rhetoric and and uh, the categories and, and these kinds of things. But okay. but all like the exciting ones, the the, the physics and. I think both ethics um, and the metaphysics, those are, are lost to, um, well, yeah, will we'll eventually be re recovered from, from Arabic and then originally the Greek, yeah. but, but the ones that are, yeah. So, so there's sort of, a, uh, yeah, we, uh, the, the joke is always sort of like we lost Aristotle and also we lost the recipe for concrete. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> well, so we can't blame, we can't blame St. Augustine too much for that. Um, but, but, Correct. But, in, 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 a, in a way, I think um, Platonism had kind of won the day, largely mm -hmm. in the Mediterranean, yeah. at least um, yeah. in the time of Augustine. Yeah. But the, you know, but then so then when when Saint Thomas, um, who was sort of the best disciple of Aristotle in a, in a way, um, when he when he sees his understanding of nature through that, what do they call the hylomorphic? theory the, the matter and form just mm -hmm. that yes. distinction alone um, gave the Catholic Church this clarity about the presentation of the sacraments that every sacrament is is composed of those two things and to have a valid sacrament you, you need to have a valid matter and a valid form and you know for the in the mind of the student and I would think in the mind of the parish priest to be so clear about the sacraments you know, to understand each sacrament is to understand the matter and the form, and, and, and that's, you know, that's pretty much the, <laughs> the essence of it. Whereas the new catechism, to sort of uh, reiterate, I think what you're saying, um, it appears to have completely abandoned that entire language. I don't think they use the, they don't, they don't use the word matter and form, for example, to just explain the sacraments. Am, am I right about that? I, the last time, um, it's been a while since I read the New Testament. It does, but, but I, I don't think it's, I don't think it comes off as strong. I do believe there are sort of material and formal elements to it. Um, one, one difficulty we run into, um, that, that would have been, a, a, you know, apparent even in Augustine's day is that we don't, we don't really have sort of like purely material elements. Uh, that the mm -hmm. sort of prime matter doesn't exist. That's this whole business, right? Not existing. Yeah. And so yeah. all material aspects of the sacrament would still have a form. And those are the things that we nitpick over, right? Is mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. you know, what is the form of this bread? Is it wheat bread, right? Uh, are mm -hmm. there any other additional ingredients to it? Because those are formal mm -hmm. distinctions in the bread. And yet we can consider the bread would be uh, the, the matter of the sacrament, right? Of, of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And so. And so yeah. you know, you, all the material elements have formal aspects to them. Um, I, you can make me yeah. an argument that the, the formal aspects come to us also through kind of material um, parts, probably less of an argument there. So, so it, it, I, I think there is a sensitivity to that just, just because uh, from, from the Catechism of the Council of Trent to um, the Vatican II, 
uh, we have um, we understand um, uh, subatomic particles. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. And so, but, so but, things but, are but, things yeah. are all electrons and neutrons and protons, but it's really their arrangement, their form that distinguishes the <laughs> well, matter. It becomes a little bit problematic to speak more kind of concretely in matter and form terms. Well, yeah, you know, I, you know, I I think that I mean part of the um, well, see, and and I think you're hitting upon something here that there's sort of a um, in our age, there needs to be a an apologetic um, that will uh, address the idea that, you know, Aristotle's physics, you know, I hold is still the correct, um, the correct understanding of the world, even, even with the advances in technology and, and uh, the understanding of subatomic particles, that, that none of that changes the essential understanding of nature that, you know, Newman, uh, remember, he's famous for saying that whether we like it or not, uh, Aristotle is the oracle of nature and of truth, and we're, we're all Aristotelians. <laughs> um, do you remember that passage in, the, in his, in his uh, idea of the university? He says, he says something like, like it or not, we're all Aristotelians because he, he has formulated our thoughts even before we were born. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm, I'm sort of proceeding from this, this basis that I think that Aristotle gave us this correct understanding of nature and that the things of grace are understood through the things of nature you know, the invisible things of God are made known through the visible things. And so without an understanding of nature, then I don't see that you can have an understanding of things like the sacraments and the things of grace. And that's, that's where I think the church might have become a little bit embarrassed about the teachings of Aristotle. And, cons- you know, if you're embarrassed about Aristotle, sure. then you're, you're going to throw St. Thomas out because you can't read a page of him without... Uh, without you know, he's always citing the philosopher, you know. And, um, sure. So, so I, I, I tend to think that the new catechism um, articulates the same truths of the faith, of course, but in a, in a uh, maybe through a glass darkly <laughs> compared to the <laughs> catechism of the Council of Trent. There's a lucidity and a clarity that the modern world has lost. As you're saying, you know, we're, we're asking these questions our, our mind has been darkened about uh, fundamental questions that um, they're sort of embarrassing to be uh, uh, asking. And therefore, the New Catechism, um, having abandoned the lucidity and clarity, and maybe even, and I, I don't know if there's a rejection of Aristotle. I, I don't think there's a re- I mean, I mean, because if you, if you reject Aristotle, you, you, you have to, you have to some, you have to play down St. Thomas. And I guess yeah, I'm kind but, of... But, but even, of, even, with, yes. even with Thomas, even with Thomas, there's like, like his, his, Thomas's genius is that he can glean from Aristotle what is helpful and, and leave behind what isn't, right? So mm-hmm. when Aristotle goes into his sort of theology of, of the, you know, the one and, and, and this sort of, um, you know, uh, God not as creator, but as sort of emanating, right, material beings and those kinds of, he's putting that, he's putting that to the side. <laughs> no, mm-hmm. intentional mm-hmm. creation in time, right? This is, this is, this is our understanding. This has been, been revealed to us. Uh, and, and, and so I, I don't, I don't, I think, I think I'm, I'm kind of, you know, one way to, to grapple with what you're saying about the differences between the, the two catechisms, mm-hmm. uh, uh, one way I might phrase it would be that the Second Universal Catechism mm-hmm. understands that that people are uh, what they need, maybe not what they desire, but what they need is milk. Whereas the Catechism of the Council of Trent was is giving more meat in the the meat milk paradigm in terms of oh, uh, of, a, of a nourishment, but not not the nourishment of, of sort of fully grown that 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 the Catechism under John Paul II recognizes that, that we don't have the language and the worldview that can support something like the Catechism of the Council of Trent anymore, and that a, a, that a, that a new catechism is necessary to, to, to draw back the faithful into uh, an understanding of the, the broader reality of, of what the church has to teach, what the church um, exists yeah. to, to do. I like your and and your your you are of course as I said before uh, 
being very generous here, and, and, I, and I don't think <laughs> uh, unjustly so, because I, I I do struggle with I do struggle with the with the new catechism's presentation when I look at the I, you know I tend to prefer older texts in the first place, and um, you know when you have a when you have a catechism put out by you know Saint Pius V and Saint Pius the uh, and Saint Charles Borromeo and and the you know they they actually one of the popes and I can't I can't remember you know he had the entire code of canon law written according to the catechism of the Council of Trent and the the accolades for this catechism are so uh, throughout the centuries you know I, you know the catechism of the Council of Trent has certainly had many more centuries for people to praise it um, the the new catechism by contrast it's interesting that they've had these different versions of it because you know there i think there were some some mistakes or unclarities um that, yes. maybe maybe that's in the three editions yes the three the three editions and and i i'm you know i, I think the the catechism of the council of trent also had various editions but the changes they made were they would the first edition had no subheadings you know maybe <laughs> had a, a paragraph here you know there was but i think uh i think it was pius the fifth that insisted that uh Hey, we got to have chapters, and <laughs> so it's it like, was more it's editorial. Like, it's, like, it's like your Ignatius Bible, right? It's like the the first edition of the, the RSV Catholic edition uh, didn't have the headings, and you're like, "What's going on?" And then, oh, okay, yeah. let's let's make one with headings so people know where yeah. they are. Um, so, so those kinds Whereas are more the, superficial. Yes, that's that's right. That's right. So, so there's sort of this this lasting perennial. I mean, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, you, you, you know you can always go to it as a sure guide for the church's teaching. Now, maybe, maybe this is a good time to bring up this, um, you know, some of the, some of the differences are noticeably, well, the big difference, one of the big differences in the teaching on capital punishment, where the, the church's presentation of capital punishment, I always maintain that um, the church's teaching on it has never changed, and it's... It, I would maintain that it's being expressed in a little bit more um, vague manner now, but the old catechism, you know, it, you can just uh, you can see it's just following Saint Thomas there that that the state, you know, the state has the right to um, ex, you know execute a criminal just like a doctor has the obligation to cut off a diseased limb, and so it has this very clear sort of Romans thirteen: of, Caesar doesn't bear the sword in vain trajectory okay yeah it, 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 and so so there are there are certain there are certain subjects of the church's teaching which which if i was to advise a student you know what does the church think about such and such i i would i can always trust the catechism of the council of trent to give a straight up to a mystic answer and uh, whereas in the in the new catechism, it's it's I think there have there has been considerable debate about, um, and 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 of course exactly. they revised it, you know, so that's that's kind of an interesting thing as well. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's, I think it is that that desire for clarity, and and I think that is a an appropriate desire that that we have as human beings, uh, as as um, the Catholic laity, as Catholic theologians. Uh, desiring to understand what is the truth and how does the church express it. Uh, so, yes. so I do think that is, that is a continuing quest, uh, although we might yeah. not be completely satisfied in current um, editions and, and the ways things are expressed. Um, it is a part of that pilgrimage that, that we get to participate in as individuals, uh, as, as members of the, the body of Christ as a whole. And so we can, we can look forward to uh, clarity in the future, uh, even if not in this life, at least clarity in the next. Uh, but but that, maybe that's a good place for us to kind of uh, end, end our session today. I want to thank you uh, again, Mark, for, for sharing your insights on the Catechism of the Council of Trent with us today. I do want to give you some time to share your projects with our audience and let them know how they can follow your work. Oh, well, thanks. And I, I, I you know, um, I hope that this has been helpful. I, there's so much to talk about in this text, and, and we've done a I think a pretty good job comparing the two catechisms. And uh, so right now um, I am on sabbatical and I am going to be continuing to write on lionandox.com about Catholic liberal education. Uh, I'm currently 
using this year to uh, just it's interesting you mentioned the confessions I just finished the confessions last week again and I uh, was just in time for the Feast of St. Augustine the other day and excellent but I'll be working on a book this year called the idea of a high school as a, uh, a tribute to John Henry Cardinal Newman I hope he doesn't mind in his idea of the university <laughs> I want to write sort of as a, a project or a dissertation for my um, for my doctorate that I want to work on this year. Um, I, I would like to explore the, the idea of a high school. What, what should secondary school education be from the principles, you know, the, the, the anthropology, the, the soul of man properly understood needs to be addressed in a, in a certain logical manner. There's a certain education that's proper to the human being and not not at the not at the university level, but in a in a level that's propedeutic to the, to what Newman is talking about. And so, I want to talk about the ideal curriculum and sort of set it forth um, in this project. I'm hoping I can do that project this year. But uh, so that's that's what I'm oh. currently working on. And that that does sound fascinating. I always um, w one of the um, I don't know if polarities or dualities that that I deal with is. Uh, how education is both natural and artificial, right? How, how it is something um, natural to human development and, and uh, in, should be in accord with sort of the realism of nature. And yet, right, there's an artificiality to it. There is something that we as artifice are putting into the system as intentional educators, not only as parents as primary educators and that those they bring into the mix to, uh, to, to provide for the intellectual and formational needs of their children. Uh, but but that it, it can't be wholly one or the other um, insofar as if it's completely natural. I'm not sure if we call it education, uh, but if it's completely artificial, um, what part of you know the nature of, of, of the child, the student, is being elevated there for, right? Um, are we yeah, making, yes. making them into something that's completely not them? Uh, and so, and so yes. I, I look forward to, to seeing kind of the progress of your project. Again, people can follow that uh, hopefully on, on your website if, if things come across to posts and those kinds of things. Uh, and, also, and also your podcast. So we'll, we'll put the links to your podcast uh, as well uh, in the description below. So uh, thank you again, Mark. For, it was a pleasure having you on the show today. For our audience, for all of us, from all of us here at the Confederate Reserve and the Better Paris Cultural Empire, thank you for watching. See you next time on the Confederate Reserve. Thank you. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. You can click here to watch a recent interview of the Confederal Reserve or over here to view the playlist of the Better Pairs podcast.